On this week's edition of New York Now, a way forward. As the coronavirus appears to decline in New York, Governor Andrew Cuomo has a new strategy for the state's economy. Uh, let's talk about reopening economies in that regional context. That plan has support from Republicans, but they want more details. I'll speak with State Senator Patrick Galvan, the top-ranking Republican on the Senate Health Committee. Small businesses are struggling while they wait for the state's economy to reopen. Greg Barilla from the National Federation of Independent Business joins me with his perspective. And Amanda Fariz from the Albany Times Union breaks down testing disparities in upstate New York and the news of the week. I'm Dan Clark, and this is New York Now. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET. Today, the Senate majority will pass a legislation we'll pass a law that prohibiting it, it, and we will take them to court challenging it. Another stand uh, for New York and sending a message. Welcome to this week's edition of New York Now. I'm Dan Clark, coming to you again this week from the state capitol. So we still don't know when businesses in New York will be allowed to reopen, but we did find out this week the state's strategy for jumpstarting the economy outside New York City. Governor Andrew Cuomo said earlier this week that certain parts of the state with fewer COVID-19 cases will be allowed to reopen before others. We operate as one state, but we also have to understand variations. And you do want to get this economy open as soon as possible. And if a situation is radically different in one part of the state than another part of the state, take that into consideration. And that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, so the, the same logic that applies to the country applies to some states, this state, where you have those varieties across the state. But that all depends on how testing plays out in areas outside of New York City where it has really lagged at times. Joining me now via Skype to talk more about that is Amanda Fries. She's a reporter with the Times Union, our partner here on New York Now. Mandy, thanks so much for joining me now via Skype. Thank you for having me. So you had this great story, and I have to highlight it, with Kayla Harris, um, the other reporter here at the Capitol, about testing in areas of upstate New York. And you looked at basically county by county, what share of the population has been tested for COVID-19 and, you know, how that compares to other counties. And I just thought it was fascinating. Tell us a little bit about what you found looking at every county individually. Well, I mean, as I think most people will suspect, the majority of the testing has really occurred downstate, um, you know, with, with rates as high as like 6% uh, per capita um, for some of the downstate counties. However, um, the further north you go, uh, the smaller that percentage is. And while there's definitely an understanding that, uh, you know, the, the hard hit areas are, are going to have more testing done at this point, it does leave a lot of questions for what is the extent of, of the virus's uh, impact in upstate counties and you have Erie County and other, you know, other northern and western counties that have really seen less than 1% of their total population tested. So um, health experts have really uh, exercised caution and encourage the public to exercise caution uh, when it comes to what the real impact is and whether or not upstate has met its apex, like has been touted um, for the state overall. Do we know why some counties have lower testing rates than others? It seems like such a wide margin. I think um, in, in your analysis, you, you know, some counties were as low as 1% or lower, and then we had Westchester at 7%. And I know that we had that big epicenter in Westchester, but do we know why some counties just don't test more people? whether it's the, the fact that people are, are not experiencing the symptoms, so they're not going out and getting those tests, they're not going to the hospital because the symptoms aren't bad. Um, so there is certainly that, that population where people might have been asymptomatic. And then there's also the struggle for some communities where they don't have a robust public health department, so there's no way to coordinate that testing and or they're relying on healthcare systems that might be spread further out or in other counties to be able to access that testing. So there's there's a lot of a lot of factors at play there. And um, it's a matter of 
everybody kind of joining forces and working together in collaboration like you've seen in Ulster County as well as now in Albany County with the mobile testing sites in a couple of different locations um, to to ramp up that testing. And that's really what's going to have to happen um, across the state in order to have a really good sample size. And that's key is the smaller the sample, the less of what you can uh, the less you can determine um, what exactly is going on. The larger the sample, the better. That's basic statistics. So you and I are talking right now about diagnostic testing, which is to find which people are currently living with COVID-19. But there's also this matter of antibody testing, which would be a test to determine who has already had it, who has recovered, who has those antibodies, and who is theoretically immune from the disease. The governor went to Washington, D.C. this week and met with the president um, and said that basically the state is going to double its testing capacity from what is now 20,000 to 40,000 sometime in the next few weeks. Do we know where those tests will be targeted or do you think, um, I, I don't remember what the governor has said. Has he said where they're going to be selected? Will he be statewide? It sounds like he wants to do it statewide. However, just with the 3,000 tests that they issued this week and the preliminary results that um, he unveiled today during his uh, daily briefing, the majority of them did go downstate. Um, I want to say it was a little over 40% of the of the total tests, the 3,000, uh, were for New York City. Um, and then there was another 32%, I believe, um, went to the rest of New York outside of Westchester, Rockland, and, and the downstate counties that have been hardest hit. So I think it remains to be seen how it's going to be distributed. There is the talk of it doing widespread across the state. However, it does seem as though there is a focus on those hardest hit areas. And so it's something we're going to have to continue to monitor going forward because um, we have to get a good sample of everywhere in New York, not just um, in one region. The governor also said this week that they are planning, and as you mentioned, a regional reopening of the economy, which was a surprise to some of us who have been covering him for the past few weeks because he's been saying that the economy in New York, businesses and schools will be opened and changed and done on a statewide level with some other states around the country, um, notably here in the Northeast. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, Mandy, but was that a flip flop for the governor or is this something that he's been gearing towards all along? I haven't been covering the governor long enough to be 100% certain whether it's a flip-flop, but it sure looks like that. Um, it, it it was within a 24-hour period that he went from, um, you know, this has got to be done on a statewide approach to, okay, maybe we do regional. Although he has alluded to looking at opening the economy on a regional uh, basis prior. However, there really seemed to be um, a stress on opening it up statewide and even with other surrounding states simply because of the concern of individuals traveling to other areas that are open for business and potentially uh, spreading that again. So it'll definitely depend on the testing capacity across New York and whether the regions can kind of see where, where are they headed and have they hit their own apex or are they still on an uptick? All right, well, we will leave it there. Amanda Freese from the Times Union, we'll check back in with you. Thank you so much for coming on New York Now. We really appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you, have a great day. So you might have seen on social media that a handful of rallies were held in areas across the state this week, calling on Cuomo to reopen businesses in rural areas. There was even one held here outside the state capitol where protesters blocked traffic and made some noise during Cuomo's daily press briefing. Here was his response. Yeah, it's your life, do whatever you want. But you're not responsible for my life. You have a responsibility to me. It's not just about you. You have a responsibility to me, right? We started here saying, it's not about me, it's about we. Get your head about the, around the we concept. So it's not all about you. It's about me too. It's about we. So as some of you know from watching the show, I'm actually from a rural area right outside of Binghamton where hospitals are few and far from in between. And that got me thinking, what would happen here in upstate New York if a second wave of COVID-19 hit rural areas? Would these hospitals be able to handle it? So I called up State Senator Patrick Gallivan from Western New York. He's the top ranking Republican on the Senate Health Committee, and he says he's also on board with a regional approach to the state's economy. Senator Pat Gallivan, thanks so much for joining us here on New York Now via Skype this week. Well, glad to be with you, Dan. 
So something that I'm really interested about and I wanted to pick your brain about because your district is, um, just for people that aren't really familiar with the counties of the state, it's kind of between Rochester and Buffalo, a very big rural district. If, and, and I should preface this by saying right now things upstate seem pretty stable. We don't seem to have an overwhelming of the hospital capacity, but if we see some sort of surge upstate, if we see a spike in cases, how prepared do you think is the rural healthcare network up there to handle something like that? I think they are prepared to the extent that they can be. Fortunately, they have not seen the influx of cases that we've seen in New York City, um, in the surrounding areas of New York City, and in and around the city of Buffalo. Uh, but I do believe they're prepared. But what, what has happened in those areas, uh, they're struggling. They had, uh, it, it was always, it's always difficult for rural or community hospitals to make ends meet. And for the hospitals that were making ends meet, they relied on the elective surgeries, the clinics, the people coming in and out of the hospital. And with the, that revenue stream being taken away from them, they have very serious cash flow issues. So two different things. If they were to have an influx of coronavirus cases, uh, it'd be very difficult to sustain the service without some sort of federal or state assistance from a cash flow perspective. That's really interesting. Other, not, Sorry, go yeah, ahead. If Sorry. On, the, on the other hand, if they're not getting the cases, uh, then they should be allowed to be doing these elective surgeries because if they're not, they're also going to run out of cash and not be able to serve the community. Today, though, uh, in Buffalo, the governor did announce that beginning next week, they were going to start phasing in uh, hospitals being permitted in certain cases to do elective surgeries. And I think that's something that can be helpful to the rural hospital network in the state. As you mentioned, in some of these smaller, not, I shouldn't say smaller counties, I should say less dense counties, because some of these counties upstate are huge, as you know, compared to counties like Albany County and Nassau, Suffolk. In some of these less dense counties, we see less cases. And I just remember at the start of this, we saw less cases because we had less testing. Do you think that in those counties, it's, it's, uh, it's that there is less testing available to people? Or do you think that it's just a situation where there's less density, so there's less people interacting, so there's less spread of the disease? I think both. And, and I say that uh, you know, in a partially uneducated way, of course. We don't know who has what. I am not, uh, I am not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I don't know the specific numbers. We're only speculating that because of the lack of sufficient number of tests up to this point, it, it, it's common wisdom or it's accepted wisdom that we don't know how much the coronavirus is out there and how many people have been affected by it. So I think the lack of testing, uh, to answer your question, is one of the things that contributes to these numbers. But the second thing is also uh, the fact that all of upstate is not as dense uh, as New York City is when it comes to the population and the proximity to each other. And we know from science that social distancing is something that's helping, uh, helping to work to help prevent or slow the spread of this disease. And in much of upstate, especially rural upstate New York, we have, uh, we have that natural open space. Uh, we don't have people living in high-rise apartments. We don't have people working in cubicles right next to each other, uh, they are spaced out. And, and so I think that is also key to reopening the economy, where when we're looking to reopen the economy across the state, uh, we should be looking at regions and treat regions and areas differently. Um, I mentioned a Livingston County with a few number of cases. Um, no doubt there are some cases there that we don't know about because of lack of testing, but by the same token, it is a more rural county. People are more spaced out. And I think businesses can be reopened in a safe and responsible way. And that's really what we, we have to do. We have to look at the combination of those things um, and recognize that we can't be have a one-size-fits-all approach as we're trying to reopen the world to us, reopen our economy, reopen our communities. Yeah, so let's let's talk about the economy a little bit, because we saw earlier this week Governor Cuomo is saying that he wants to take a regional approach to reopening the economy, which is something that lawmakers um, have, Republicans mostly have called for for the past couple of weeks now. As you said, looking at different counties around the state, you just don't have 
that amount of coronavirus cases and the need there to really separate people as much as that. Are you optimistic about the state's plan to reopen regionally? Is that does that satisfy you for what you want out of, you know, kind of getting things back in order? I'm very pleased that the governor is talking about reopening the state, so to speak, on a regional basis. That makes all the sense in the world. It makes just as much sense as the governor of New York State's involvement with other states where we're doing something regionally as it relates to the entire United States and the Northeast. We should be doing the same thing within our own state. So now is the time, though, for action. Instead of just talking that we're going to reopen this regionally. So what does that look like, I guess? What um, what questions do you think the state should be asking when it's looking to reopen the economy in kind of these rural areas where we don't see a lot of cases? What's been on my mind, and it may have been on your mind as well, is you know maybe we haven't seen the cases in these rural areas because we haven't reopened yet. And in the back of my mind, I just have this fear of like, these rural hospitals might be overwhelmed if we reopen too soon. What does that balance look like for you going forward? If we go too far too soon, that's a problem. First and foremost, public safety has to be in everybody's mind and that must come first. How do we reopen safely? So we look at certain areas where the incidents, incident of coronavirus cases are low. We do some of the testing that's in place. Uh, we we kind of have an idea of what we're facing. And when we start some of these businesses back, we continue to practice the precautions, the, the social distancing, the wearing of personal protective equipment where it's appropriate to do so. Right. I really fear for these small businesses everywhere in the state. I mean, New York City, but upside, especially when you already had so much burden on these businesses and now to tell them you, you have to be closed for two months, no option of revenue, it's got to be frustrating. And, um, you know, speaking of revenue, I want to get your thoughts on the budget before I let you go. One part of the budget, is, and I think everybody was kind of surprised about it, is going to let the governor cut spending throughout the year if the state doesn't have enough revenue. I'm wondering how you feel about that. If you have an opinion on it, um, he and just for our viewers, he could cut uh, spending to schools, local governments, hospitals, a lot of things. Uh, how do you see that? The legislature has moved away from a system that was designed by our forefathers, a system of check and balance, checks and balances. This clearly tilts the budgetary process, uh, not just during the budget making process, but now uh, the fulfilling of that budget and, and it, it, for, the, six, for the, the 12 months after a budget is adopted, now the governor has, an, uh, un, the playing field is no longer level and it clearly tilts in the governor's favor and that's not good for citizens. All right, well, we will check back in with you. Senator Pat Galvan from uh, Western New York, thank you so much for being here on New York Now this week. Always great to talk to you. Thanks for your time, Dan. At the heart of all of this are small businesses, which usually don't have a lot of wiggle room as it is. We know that at the end of this, some of those businesses just won't reopen. Others are getting help from the federal government, but that's not always enough. I spoke with Greg Barilla from the National Federation of Independent Business about what's next for small companies here in New York. Greg Barilla from the National Federation of Independent Business, thanks so much for joining us here on New York Now via Skype this week. Thanks for having me, Dan. So, Greg, we saw this week that Congress came to an agreement to add more money to what's called the Paycheck Protection Program, which essentially is money that the federal government is allowing these small businesses, some not so small, to pay their employees for an additional eight weeks. And if they use that money just on salaries and, and wages, um, that, that funding, that loan will theoretically be forgiven. Um, I just want to get your reaction to that. Is that enough to get small businesses through this time? I know it's really tough out there right now. Uh, it's extremely difficult. And before we talk about the specifics of the Paycheck Protection Loan Program or what Congress um, has agreed to this week, uh, it's important to note, uh, to your last point, NFIB for 30 years has been doing something called the Small Business Optimism Index. Uh, and just to underscore the anxiety out there, uh, the March number dropped eight points. It was the largest single month-to-month -month decrease in the history of the metric. Uh, wow. And we haven't seen April's yet, but that just underscores and gives a snapshot of the anxiety of small businesses out there. So now we come to the Paycheck Protection Loan Program and what Congress has done. 
Uh, the Paycheck Protection Loan Program is, as of right now, the most effective relief for small businesses. As you mentioned, it can be forgiven, so it basically can turn into a direct cash grant if used for the proper purposes, which include payroll and then some additional operating expenses like rent, uh, utilities, some debt services, mortgages. Uh, and that's incredibly important because the number one problem for small businesses right now is cash flow. The average mm. small business has 30 to 60 days, one to two months of cash on hand without new revenue, which means they are going to start going under. They simply don't have the resources. So the federal government did find a rather intelligent way to inject funding into millions of small businesses to allow them uh, to, to operate for the next couple of weeks. Uh, and this has really been a lifeline for many of them. And for NFIB, the group that you're representing, you want some more flexibility with this money? Is that what I, I'm understanding from reading some of the documents that you sent me? Um, so like you said, you can use this money for salaries, rent, things like that. What else do you think that the money should be able to use, be used for by these small businesses for these loans to be forgiven? A couple of different things. Uh, for one, uh, there's some other operational expenses like insurance costs that all those bills are coming due. And, and New York State uh, has done some things to delay or defer those payments, but they'll have to be paid a, eventually. We think the PPP program should be allowed to cover some of those costs. And the hard 75% threshold, uh, which has to be spent on rehiring or retaining uh, employees, uh, that rigid one size fits all number can be difficult for some businesses. We completely understand that we wanna use this funding to rehire uh, individuals and employees, get people off of the over distressed and, and overwhelmed unemployment insurance system. But certain businesses simply, the majority of their costs don't always come from labor. Certain businesses have a lot of equipment uh, and maintaining that sort of stuff can be a, a significant capital cost. Others, depending on where they're located in the state, real estate costs can be incredibly expensive. So we just like to see a little bit more flexibility so that these programs can help as many small businesses as possible, which they're intended to do. Has the state done anything to help in, in terms of things like that? I hear a lot of the federal action in these stimulus bills, but in my mind, from a, a small business perspective, I could see a small business owner thinking, well, the state is the entity that made me shut down per orders from Governor Cuomo. So has the state done anything to help provide some relief for these businesses? You know, the state has done some things uh, on a much smaller scale. Uh, and for a, a number of reasons which I can get into, uh, the state has suspended some uh, sales tax remittance deadlines uh, for certain small businesses to try to allow them to keep cash on hand. Um, the state has passed um, some liability protections for certain types of healthcare employers and healthcare facilities, uh, making sure that they don't get overwhelmed with lawsuits. Uh, the state's exploring other, other um, uh, deadlines and, 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 and fees and fines for noncompliance that can be suspended. We are in communication with the governor and his staff every day on these things, and they're great first steps. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the state is really confronted with the public health care, the public health crisis associated with COVID-19. Uh, you've seen the resources deployed downstate, resources deployed across the state to confront the public health aspect, and the state is burning through money to do so. Uh, the state cannot print money. The governor's been very open and honest that we are in a very real budget crisis of our own um, concern here in New York and in Albany. So the immediate relief is coming from Washington. That relief is a lifeline right now. The state is going to need to be doing things down the road when we reopen to make sure that small businesses, once they survive the crisis, they thrive. I think the big question on everybody's minds right now is when our business is going to reopen. And I'm curious to, to hear from your perspective. So I think the best relief for small businesses would be for businesses to reopen, but then you have to balance that against the public health risk. And that's what we're kind of looking at this week with the governor saying that regional economies could open. So some economies could open before others. Where do you see that balance with these small businesses reopening to recoup some of that revenue? but also trying not to put other people at risk of catching this disease? Oh, well, I think we have to be perfectly clear that the public health um, data, uh, science, and experts are what's going to drive this decision-making. I think the governor's followed that path um, as he has navigated this um, since it first arrived in New York State. Um, so we're going to have to put public health first. But 
you saw the governor intimate this week that he is beginning to to really think about different strategies, different ideas. He's he's put some individuals in charge of, of downstate economic considerations. And then he's talked or he's named Lieutenant Governor Kathy Hochul uh, and former Lieutenant Governor Bob Duffy um, as appointees to consider how to open different regions upstate. And we're going to have to look at, um, you know, density uh, realities in different communities across this state. We're going to have to look at, trans at transmission rates um, and infection rates. And we're going to have to look at what sort of businesses have low risk, what sort of businesses can change their operations and implement with a little bit more ease than perhaps others, um, social dis distancing um, practices and, you know, can change the density in their own workplace, uh, in their own space uh, to, to meet public health guidelines and, and the dictates of public safety. Those are all things that are beginning to be considered as thankfully, thankfully, um, you're starting to see some positive news on the public health front um, as the COVID-19 infection rates and other metrics being cited by the governor and his team seem to be getting under control. Well, we will have you back for an update as these businesses start to consider reopening and the state moves forward with that plan. Uh, until then, thank you so much, Greg Barilla from the National Federation of Independent Business for joining us here on New York Now via Skype this week. Anytime, Dan. Stay safe and be well. We're covering issues like that daily over on our website at nynow.org. Please join us there every day for coverage of the coronavirus and other issues. And follow us on social media at nynow underscore PBS. Until then, thanks for watching this week's New York Now. Have a great week and be well. Funding for New York Now is provided by WNET.